All right, welcome to the M. Moser Hong Kong office. It's wonderful to have you here, Vicky, Kevin, and Winston. <laughs> okay, and I think Florence is going to be joining us in a few minutes. And welcome to everyone who has joined us on the webinar. This is really an experiment that we're doing. Oh, here's Here's Florence. Hi. Hi Florence. <laughs> Glad you made it. That's okay. You made it just in time. Just in time. Okay. What we're going to do this evening, we have a presentation followed by Q&A, but before that, we thought we would experiment and take you on a live tour of the office so you can see how we work and get a better idea of who we are. Now, we have been here for almost four years. But before we came here, we did a six month study in our old location to figure out how we want to work together. And this is the result, very informal. You can see that we've taken advantage of the greenery outside and we have greenery inside as well. And so it makes a very lively environment. Now, Oh, I forgot to say one thing for those of you on the webinar, please remember to submit your questions. I think there is a chat box or a Q&A box or something like that for it, okay? So let's proceed. You can follow me around and I will show you what we do and, and how we are. This is one model, the Western Academy of Beijing outside of Beijing in China. And as happens with so many projects in China, I'm sure you know. We'd completed the schematics and then the client couldn't get the land. So <laughs> it's a lovely model. I'd love to see it built. But over here, you can see something that is being built. This is, this is a model of the Lenovo project that we're doing in Shanghai. Some can tell you a lot of details about that. Uh, where we have created a courtyard arrangement of three new buildings and the renovation of an existing one, creating a really important place in the whole neighborhood environment. And if you turn around, this is some of our colleagues working from home in London. They've sent us a video and this is the way we can keep connected with our fellow colleagues in London. They unfortunately haven't been able to go back to the office yet, but they're working from home <laughs> and exercising too. <laughs> there you can see, getting a little exercise. <laughs> okay, so if you come over here, I want to show you something we're very proud of. This is our firm award that we got from the AI International Region. And what is really lovely is what they say. It is for pushing boundaries, leading sustainability and wellness initiatives, integrating design solutions, and creating a community working together globally to build environments which enable people and businesses to achieve and exceed their potential. Now, I just thought of something. For those of you who don't know me, this is what I really look like. <laughs> but I'm going to put the mask back on because we still have colleagues working in the office here as well as our guests. And we're following, following the Hong Kong government advisory guidelines. So I hope you don't mind the masks. <laughs> OK, in addition to the Affirm Award, we have four sustainability awards that we're very proud of here. The uh, LEED Gold certification for our office here in Hong Kong. And most of our offices have achieved gold or at least silver. In fact, I think all of them have globally. This is the Hong Kong Green Building Council Platinum Beam Award for Sustainability. This is, although it's the smallest one, it's the, perhaps the most important. It's the well certification platinum for the interior. In other words, it's for the people who use the building inside. And if you think about how much time we spend in our buildings, 
yes, we need to make them really healthy. And reset certification so the air you're breathing is very clean in here. Very important. Now, as we go along, you'll see that in addition to meeting rooms, we have a number of individual small rooms for one or two people. This one is very special. It has a sink, it has drapes, and why do you think that is? It's a mother's room for lactating mothers, new mothers, and we've had several of them since we moved into the office. So it's really important. But then as we go along beyond these first couple of meeting rooms, here you'll see we have a little bit of an exercise area and we have regular, um, what are they, pilates or, or exercise sessions for our colleagues because it's very important for our people to really get some exercise and not just sit at the computer all day. So we have a stationary bike and if you're frustrated because you can't get that design you wanted, there you go. <laughs> okay. And we have here, we share some of the uh, projects that our other colleagues have been working on in other offices around the world, just to keep an idea of what's happening everywhere. So it's not just Hong Kong, it's really everywhere. Now keep going back. There you go. This is important. With COVID 19, we have taken immediately here in Hong Kong measures to have an even cleaner environment. And now we have also added the enhanced catalytic oxidation in our ductwork to kill the virus, kill the germs. This is really, really important. And we have the ionizer as well. And we have some additional air purification pieces. And we have the regular things that we take care of, like we actually, ha, huh, here's where COVID-19 has made a problem in disturbing the supply chain because the disinfectant, the UV disinfectant that we ordered hasn't arrived yet. It's about to, it's on the way. The same for the additional touchless faucets for the mother's room and the pantry. We have them already in the bathrooms, but you know we have to wait until they arrive. But I just wanted to show you that we have immediately taken actions to really protect our people. And we have done this in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Chengdu, our offices are talking about, in Singapore, in Taiwan, and the other offices globally, as soon as they are able to get back to work, they will be doing the same for those offices. So it's really important for us to keep our own people healthy. And then we can also advise our clients that these are things that they can do to keep their people healthy. So we're all working on that. Now this, is our IT bar and it's a bar everybody can you can stick your foot up here and just order a new system <laughs> not, <laughs> not quite <laughs> but it's important for us to to uh, keep our all of our IT equipment and, and paraphernalia up to date and to upgrade it with new things and to keep our global VDC in really effect effectively working because we're in constant contact with one another in all our offices so it's a really important area and uh, you can see they're still working <laughs> now i am lucky i get an office because <laughs> i'm the older generation <laughs> okay and i have a view as well but it's quite open, as you can see. And when I'm not here, it's another meeting area. 
So. <laughs> so clean, you said? <laughs> well, we cleaned everything up today just for this <laughs> tour. <laughs> As you can see, we have a lot of different seating arrangements um, so that people have the option to get together and work in whatever ever groups or individual arrangements they want in the way that's going to be most effective for them. It's really important not to have one size fits all. I think that's great. Well, yeah, you can move around if you want to. But actually, it's interesting. If you think about it, most of us, not everyone, but most of us are creatures of habit. And we tend to find a place where we feel really comfortable. So I would say that maybe 85% of our people have kind of decided where they want to be most of the time, but the other 15% move around all the time. So it's optional. Whatever works best. I think that's the important part. Whatever works best. And you can see we have, you can see we keep trees inside as well. <laughs> now over here, we have our pantry. And of course, as you know, food is very important, particularly in Hong Kong. So we always have fresh fruit, good things for people to eat, to keep them healthy. And as you can see what we've written up here, we're providing during this COVID-19 episode, we're providing free lunches, including Chinese soup twice a week. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Because it's too difficult, even though there are a lot of places to eat outside, it's too difficult to go out, find a place where you can have your social distance and get what you want. So we have other, this is not just for eating, we have people work here as well. Sometimes people will prefer sitting here. And here, a remote phone charger. And we're going to probably be putting more of these around in the office because you don't want to have to run out of juice or find a place to plug in. So if it's available where you're working, it makes it a lot easier. It's very important. Now we often have presentations here, particularly at the end of the week and uh, of some of our colleagues talking to each other and what they've been doing. We also have uh, suppliers come in and show us their new materials, the new equipment they have. As you can see, we draw on the walls all the time. <laughs> and so that's our library over there. And uh, here's, this is one of our meeting rooms. This is our Beethoven room. Now we have named the meeting rooms for geniuses to inspire us. And this one, as you can say, see, Beethoven said, to play without passion is inexcusable. And you can see there how we draw on the walls all the time. <laughs> it's really fun to do that and important. And we have lockers for people. Instead of having fixed desk locations, everybody has a locker and those are scattered all around the office in different spots. And then over here, we have more people working in teams. And what I'm going to show you, if these gentlemen with the camera don't run into it, <laughs> this is our wormhole. Hi! Hi! <laughs> that on the right, that is our Guangzhou office. On the left, uh, on the, is Shenzhen. On the left is our Guangzhou office, okay? That's our wormhole. It's the first one we have here in Hong Kong. We'll probably have a few more. We have one also. Hi, guys. We, <laughs> we also have one between our Beijing and Shanghai office. And it's really important because it helps people feel connected and feel that they're really working together. This is very important for us because 
our greater Bay Area teams are not in three different locations. They're in all three locations, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. And these guys you see on the screen work with these guys in the office together on projects. This is fantastic. Is this on? It's on all day. Wow. It's just, it's just there. Yeah. It's really important. It's a great way of connecting. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> So as you can see, most people have gone home. This, it's after hours, but uh, few are still working. And we work in project teams, and that's why we connect so much. We don't have departments. We have project teams with everybody that you need on a project getting together and working on that project, collaborating and, and integrating their ideas and their needs. More individual rooms here. Lots of layout space, of course. And we have engineers, as you know, we have in-house engineers as well. Not structural, but MEP and IT. And they work with the teams, the project teams. And then if they want to just get together themselves, they have an area there for, the, for themselves too. Now, every office, every business has admin and finance, and so do we. They've all gone home this evening, which is nice. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Generally, they can get their work done. We're the ones who have to work so much longer <laughs> to get our work done. That's always the case, right? <laughs> and they have lots of uh, filing space there. So we're nearly finished, but I want to show you the corner up here, which is the most important, actually. This is the corner that Song has dominated with the uh, our architectural creative work. And uh, we have a 3D printer so that we can play around with things and mat do massing uh, studies. This is for a project. This is for a project in, uh, in the Philippines. You can see the larger model there. That's what was finally decided. But actually, to tell you the truth, it was a lot easier to do the massing studies on the computer. <laughs> but these are great toys. Right? <laughs> They're like little cars. <laughs> so, okay. So, that just about concludes, ah, oh, there's one more model I want to show you over here. This is an innovation center that we designed for Henkel in Dusseldorf in Germany. We have done a number of projects for Henkel in China. And although we don't have an office in Germany, they felt that we really understood what they were trying to achieve. So they asked us to design this for them. And we worked with a, uh, a German, uh, a local, a German local engineering firm, and it's now in construction. So uh, we're quite proud of that. So we find a way, even when we don't have an office in a location, we find a way to get the work done. Okay. So that concludes the tour. And now we'll go into the Einstein room. And Einstein always reminds us to be passionately curious. And we're going to have a little something to drink and something to nibble on. And so those of you who are joining us virtually, please, you have something to drink and something to nibble on. And then we will get to the presentation. OK? Thank you. Thank you. OK. All right, this is a story that I told at the um, AIA International Region 
uh, conference in November when we received the Firm of the Year Award. It's about the story of growing from Hong Kong into China and then globally. Now you all have fascinating stories to tell everyone who's on the webinar as well about your successful practices in Hong Kong and other places. But perhaps some parts of our story will resonate with you. Over the years, there have been four drivers to our growth. Now, keeping good people and responding to client demands are pretty obvious. But geopolitical events have had a lot to do with our starting in Hong Kong in the first place. And they have continued to influence our growth. As our focus is on the workplace, from interior floors to company headquarters to corporate campuses, the increasingly rapid change in the nature of work continues to drive our growth. And as we come through COVID-19 pandemic, it'll be fascinating to see how this changes again. Our story starts with two geopolitical events that happened within the space of a year. Now, before I came to Hong Kong, I had been living and working as an architect in Tehran, Iran, for a number of years. And then, in 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini took over the government of Iran. As an American, I was no longer welcome. As a woman architect, it would not be possible for me to continue working. I even received Yankee go home phone calls. So it was time for me to leave. Now by then, China's 1978 open door policy was already opening the country to foreign businesses and Hong Kong as an entry point was a boom town. Many US companies were setting up in Hong Kong so they could push their business ahead in China. Rapid change was in the air. Now I had explored Hong Kong in 1977-78 as a visiting research scholar representing the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, studying how tall buildings were developing in the city. And in talking with the city's leading architectural firms, I heard the message several times, there's a lot happening here. And if you come back, we have a job for you at our firm. So, as I left Iran, Hong Kong beckoned, and I quickly found a position with one of the city's major architectural firms, Wong Tung and Partners. Now, we are all familiar with the Hong Kong of today, a visually sophisticated urban environment with many tall buildings. But take a look at that smaller white building behind the Ferris wheel, Jardine House, previously known as Hong Kong Center. It was the tallest building in the central district when I came to Hong Kong 40 years ago. Now it's dwarfed by high rises. And Hong Kong has changed so rapidly. And as Hong Kong grew, into an international city. And Moser Associates also grew into a global firm. So the stories are intertwined. Now, seeing that US companies with their eyes on China were establishing in Hong Kong and needed office facilities, in 1981, we started our very small firm with just three people. As an American architect, I understood what these US companies really needed, and by 1981, understood how their projects could be delivered locally. Being a member of the AIA was invaluable because clients equated it with professionalism and integrity. But there was one strange thing. 
They always assumed we represented a US-based firm and were quite surprised to learn that we had actually started in Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong at that time was still a British colony and AIA credentials and a California license were not formally recognized. Hong Kong had licensing reciprocity with the UK. So I had to get a UK architectural license and then a Hong Kong license. It was rather convoluted, but it worked. Now, when we started, we had no vision of becoming a global firm. We were too busy just keeping up with the work to even think about the future. We didn't even take photos of completed projects back then. And look how we worked. Everything was done by hand drafting the straight edges and triangles. We did have calculators by that time, but no computers. And you can see me at the left of the photo, obviously younger then than I am now. Now, in 1983, the American Club in Hong Kong launched a competition for a country club with the criteria that the design was to be composed of a US-based architect and a Hong Kong-based architect. We got together with William Turnbull, the San Francisco architect, and jointly went after the commission. And we won it, our first architectural project in Hong Kong. In those days, of course, this is 1983, there was no internet and everyone was still hand drafting. So to do the project, we exchanged rolls of drawings across the Pacific between Hong Kong and San Francisco every weekend by courier. But it worked. And the American Country Club brought us our first AIA awards from the California Council for Outstanding Design and from the San Francisco chapter for interior design, interior architecture. And we did a few other architectural projects in Hong Kong, such as the Shumei Church in Sai Kung and the Asia International Tower a multi-story go down for containers, which seemed quite tall at the time, but is now hidden by taller surrounding buildings. Now, but during these early days, we were continuing to design and deliver offices for international private sector businesses. And we found we enjoyed providing facilities for the people who would use the environments that we designed. We were doing a lot of work for financial institutions, but dealing rooms were pretty primitive in the 80s. And back then, many companies wanted to show off the fact that they actually had computers. And offices in the 80s were thought of as a sea of cubicles with people working quite individually and knowledge work was primarily paper-based. Back then, before computers were ubiquitous, layout and stacking plans were based on which departments needed to be adjacent because of the paper flow. How times have changed. The nature of work and the environments that support it have changed hugely since then. This is a recent project by our Taipei office for Hewlett Packard. Our first expansion out of Hong Kong was to Taipei in 1989. And it happened because we had a very good staff member here in Hong Kong who wanted to move there. So committed to keeping good people, we said to her, okay, go to Taipei and see if you think we could develop an office there. And she did. Now, our work in Taiwan has grown substantially since then. This is the hub building for Google's data center on the west coast of Taiwan, 
it's still in concept design. And what's really exciting for us is that this is a holistic appointment. We're designing the building, the interiors, the engineering, and managing the construction. So it's close to being a master builder. Song and his team are working with our colleagues in both Taiwan and Shanghai on this project. So he can tell you more about it. So how did we get into China? Okay, back in 1989, John Selry, who many of you know, but who is currently stuck in the US due to the COVID-19 lockdown, and Dick Mack had joined us. Both of them later became our partners. Dick, being a Hong Kong native, looked at the growing multinational client demand for our services in China and said, I think we can grow our firm on the mainland too. And he made it happen. Starting in Shanghai in 1993, again with just three people, then expanding to Beijing and Guangzhou to respond to the needs of corporate clients. With mutual clients, our people in Hong Kong and Taipei were already collaborating with our mainland teams to create the best results for our clients. Our growth was not just in locations and numbers of staff. As we had done in Hong Kong, our services expanded in China to include engineering, IT infrastructure, and workplace strategy, as you can see in this recent facility for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Shanghai is now our largest office globally, with a history of projects for many multinational clients throughout China, and now more and more for Chinese private enterprises as well. Now, looking back at the 90s, we established M. Moser Associates in Singapore, our first move beyond Greater China. We were also doing projects in Kuala Lumpur from our Singapore office. And by 2004, it was obvious that we should have a team in KL. So we opened there as well. Now, in the early 2000s, the nature of work for multinationals began to embrace an even more open culture with a conscious focus on providing amenities in the workplace itself. For this project for Nokia in Singapore, done in 2005, gosh, that's 15 years ago, isn't it? With our co combination of design and construction management, we punched through the slab and modified a typical commercial building to create linkages and to bring people together. Now, this project was important because the success of that project led to Nokia asking us to design their major campus on a greenfield site in Beijing. John Selry can tell you the stories about this project, but the short version is that we tried twice to decline because at that time, we didn't have architectural capabilities in China itself. But the client knew that we take responsibility for the end result. So they asked us a third time, and we finally agreed to be the lead consultant for the project. It was a collaboration of our colleagues from our Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Beijing offices. Designing from the inside out to make sure the workplace would function effectively. We brought in Arup for the base building, architectural detailing and engineering. But having developed our lead design and certification services by then as well, we also made this the first LEED Gold Certified Commercial Building in China. Now, by 2000, we had grown substantially in Greater China and Singapore, and we had also grown in terms of the services that we could provide for our global clients. So with many of our clients being multinational financial institutions, 
it seemed to our entrepreneurial way of thinking that we should look at London, another major financial center. We opened in London and sure enough, many of our global clients plus UK and European clients we had not known in China or Asia responded to our holistic architectural approach to designing and delivering the workplace. This one, for example, is a project we did for Bloomberg in London. Now with the growth we had in China and Asia, we had actually never considered going back to the US, even though that's where I came from. But in 2002, the importance of keeping good people actually led us to New York. Our colleague who had been leading our Shanghai office for several years decided with his family that they should return to New York for their kids' education. That's Robert Ma. Rather than lose a very good colleague, and considering that so many of our clients were US-based, we decided to go with him and open in New York. What we've learned is that it is harder to find new good people than it is to find new good projects. So stick with your good people. Now, going to the US has been an interesting learning experience. The approach of holistic design with one point of responsibility that supported our growth in China and Asia was and is today quite different from the US architectural industry's siloed approach. But we have found that clients like our approach, and as a result, we're doing many interesting projects. A recent example is this repurposing of two old connected structures, one from 1911, the other from the 1930s, that are along the New York High Line we're doing this for Google. And we've also been tasked with upgrading the complex to meet the living building challenge. This project team includes our colleagues in the US, in London, in Shanghai, all working together with our international, with our internal global collaboration. Now, there was another geopolitical event that prompted our growth in the early 2000s. In 2008, Shenzhen, having been established in 1980 as a special economic zone, was directed to promote, among other things, an independent innovation system for opening up and regional cooperation. It was by 2008, one of the fastest growing cities in the world. So although our Guangzhou team had been doing some projects in Shenzhen prior to that, it was now time for us to be established in Shenzhen itself. And what we quickly found, given the global financial meltdown of 2008, was that it was mainland China companies that were on the rise. This has continued, as you can see here, with our recently completed Qplex complex, creating a new urban office ecosystem for the client. And this is done with our Greater Bay Area teams. Some of those people you saw in the wormhole, plus some of our people here in Hong Kong. Now, at the same time, India was calling. Our holistic approach with one point of responsibility for the final result was developing client demand for us to help them in India. So between 2008 and 2011, we established locations in Delhi, Bangalore, and Mumbai. Now our growth in India has been through multinational clients for whom we've done work elsewhere primarily in the US and the UK, including financial institutions and IT companies. Our culture of internal collaboration globally and open exchange of information has been a blessing. 
and our strong focus on workplace strategy has led to clients like City asking us to develop a workplace of the future, which we've done for them in Chennai, as you can see here. Now, back in China, we had obtained sufficient licenses to be able to do architectural work ourselves, small scale, not high rise. This allows us to really lead the entire projects that we do. We've always followed the concepts of the AIA's A141 contract form to take full responsibility, which is pretty close to being a master builder. So we started in China to do projects that involve significant architectural modifications to existing buildings, as well as completion of the interior workplace or the creation of a client's headquarters while utilizing an existing foundation that was already in the ground. Or an entire campus on a greenfield site. And around the same time, we had an interesting project in Guangzhou, converting an old multi-building manufacturing facility into an office campus for Tencent a great experience in adaptive reuse and Tencent continues to come back to us, which is very nice. Now in China, we had been doing some smaller projects for Lenovo, which led to our winning the commission to design their new R&D campus in Shanghai's Zhangjiang district, the model you saw earlier as we were taking the tour. That project now in construction with several new structures plus renovation of an existing building is designed as a workplace specifically for the Lenovo users, as well as a business campus planned for neighborhood activity and access. And you saw the model outside when you came into the office and Sung can tell you more about it. And we had been doing a number of architectural renovations in China for the German firm Henkel and were asked to give them a proposal for their innovation center in Dusseldorf. Not a standard office building, not a standard workplace, but an innovation center. Now we don't have an office in Germany at all, but we designed a building for them collaborating with local engineers and it is now in construction. So even where we don't have an office, we do find a way to expand our work globally to respond to client demand. And again, someone can tell you about this project. So what was happening for us in the United States at this time? Our New York office was getting inquiries about projects in other US cities all the way to California. Now, John and I are both from California. So we decided that the best way to cover the US would be to have a team in California too. San Francisco was the logical choice with many of our global IT clients being in Silicon Valley and with easy travel connections to Asia. Now we've been doing some exciting projects in San Francisco, such as this major facility for Stripe and through the collaboration of our teams, we're continuously connecting with our global clients. Oops, I went, how can I go back? I went, oh, yeah, okay. Very recently, we've grown again to Vancouver, Manila, Melbourne, and Sydney to keep our good people who were going to relocate there for their own personal reasons. And our London office has expanded to Amsterdam, a move we made a few years ago as a safeguard against the geopolitical event of Brexit. Now here is a project we're doing in Cebu in the Philippines with the collaboration of our colleagues in Manila, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. And you saw the little massing models, the little 3Ds out there, okay? 
This is another example of how our internal global connectivity and collaboration has allowed us to grow. Again, I think Sung, you can tell everybody more detail about this. Now, one special area we, we've expanded in the last decade is our services in sustainability, particularly with lead, well, and reset. These sustainability approaches are an integral part of all our design and engineering work. Christine Bruckner, who most of you know, but who isn't with us this evening, as she's, she too is currently stuck in the US because of the COVID-19 lockdown, has she's been leading the growth of our capabilities in this area. We take this seriously in all our own offices, as you may have noticed when we walked around earlier, as well as for our clients. As our focus is on the workplace at all scales, we are constantly looking ahead. So before I close, I'd like to show you a quick video of our New York office, recently installed in a historic Woolworth building and show you how we are looking at the wireless workplace coming now in the 21st century. We think differently about people at work. It's not just about creating a workplace but a platform for real people to solve the world's most difficult and pressing issues. This means creating physical environments that support creativity and productive working relationships, digital environments that intuitively connect people and ideas into communities, and a cultural environment that enables authenticity supported by tools and methods to promote high performance. We see the highest performing organizations as those that align the physical, digital, and cultural environment. We notice there are no plugs on the floor, no place to plug in. It's wireless. <laughs> okay, so we're looking ahead to the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Q&A? Yes, thank you. I'm, I work here, but I'm, I'm always inspired just to see this. <laughs> <laughs> so we did receive a, a couple of, I believe, pretty good questions. Uh, and then we do have some time for it. So uh, maybe we, we dig into to some of those. Mm -hmm. One of the, the first question was, how did Moser work with multiple countries and jurisdictions? It's hard enough to master one country, and then you have 20 countries in your list. We don't have 20 countries, we have 21 locations. Okay, but it's still global, okay. Uh, and each one will have different guidelines. So we have to find a balance between global approaches to design and the local implementation aspects. We always need someone on the ground to actually get the thing built whether it is one of our own people or whether it's someone from a third party that we are collaborating with. So that's the way we do it. Great. Uh, another one here, uh, a bit of a start. I really admire and Moser standing behind their design with design build. What, what advice would you give young firms looking to make that transition? How do you budget for your first errors while maintaining a level of transparency with clients? <laughs> okay, so you always have to eat your own mistakes. Uh, particularly with design and build, there's nobody else to blame. You're, that's what we do. We take the single point of responsibility. So that said, the transparency of open book design and build really allows the client to see what is happening all the way along. There's nothing hidden. And so 
that is the best way, I think, to avoid mistakes and avoid errors. Okay, questions that keep coming, so they just test them and the technology works. Uh, for younger firms that have no exposure, how do you market yourself to reach new markets or countries? What uh, advice would you give? Well, your half of clients are your best marketers. Uh, and very often clients, uh, for us, we, we tend to work with multinational clients. So they have their connections through their own organizations and word gets around. That's really the most valuable way. The other way, of course, is to participate in industry events. And I don't mean the ones where we're talking to other architects because we're, we talk to each other all the time, but industry events that are really focused on the people in the client organizations who are involved in bringing in architects. So that's something that we do quite a bit of as well. There is one which, uh, uh really relates back to the current situation. So now that so many people are working from home, will corporations consider downsizing their office and let people continue to work from home and reduce their operation costs? Or will offices grow to allow more social distancing? Not likely in Hong Kong due to uh, uh, the rental costs, but elsewhere. Will cubicles come back? I guess that's the joke part. <laughs> that's a long one, okay. <laughs> well, I think that, um, the office itself will become more and more an area for collaboration, for getting together and not for doing individual work. As long as we have the technological connectivity and we can work from anywhere, then individual work doesn't have to be done in the office with everybody else. Okay, so that is probably going to create a change. So the office itself will probably become more predominantly meeting areas and collaboration areas rather than individual work points. Does that answer it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, so I'm screening the, the questions and then we did receive quite a few uh, complimentary feedback on the office tour and then the office itself. I just oh. wanted to that's very nice. That thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, another question here is with over 1,000 staff in over uh, 20 offices, uh, 21 as you mentioned, how do you maintain such consistent quality of design and execution of your projects? Who has the final say on design decisions? In short, what is your secret sauce? <laughs> <laughs> this, in short, the secret <laughs> sauce is finding good people. I spend a great deal of time looking for good people. All of our senior people spend a great deal of time looking for good people. That is the secret sauce. That and the culture of responsibility and the culture of collaboration, the integration of everything that we do working together is so critical to the end result. So that's basically what I think makes it happen. How would you compare a designer architect led design and build versus a contractor led design and build? I think it's uh, uh, what the question is really referring to. Is... I think I know what they're referring <laughs> to, yeah, okay. Okay, we are content creators, right? So doesn't it make sense that the content creator should be leading the implementation of that content rather than separating it so that you create the content but somebody else does it it'll never be quite right the contractors are not the content creators they are valuable colleagues because they know how to do things that we don't do so we have to work in a, in a team collaborative sense yes but we're the content creators excellent a more generic question. What would you think about the future of workplaces or workplace design to be like in terms of future directions? The future direction? Well, as I said earlier, I do think that it is going to be more and more the workplace, whether it is an entire campus or a building or just an office floor, 
is going to be more and more for interaction, collaboration, for people getting together. We still like to get together. It's nice to work alone without being disturbed, but it can get pretty lonely after a while, okay? So I do think that that is what is the direction in the future. Mm, understood. Yeah, if you would like to ask a question, that's too. <laughs> that's fine too. But yeah. maybe that's... <clears throat> yeah, we pretty much covered. But, uh, yeah, so, so you started the presentation mentioning about uh, you previously lived in the Tehran and, and how it, being a woman architect has been very difficult to, to practice there. And from your career, um, do you see being a woman architect actually benefit your career or do you see it as some challenge or do you have any advice for women architects? <laughs> well, <laughs> I've been at it for a long time. <laughs> okay. It was, um, to get my very first job in America it was a little difficult, mm -hmm. okay? But actually, in Asia, I have found it not difficult at all. What I found here is that if you can do something, mm -hmm. if you can contribute, if you can make something happen, people will welcome you. Mm -hmm. So, and that is very gratifying to me, mm -hmm. right? I hope, that there will never be that I hope that there will never be so many years that we have to say, oh, she's a woman architect. Mm -hmm. We don't say you're a man architect, mm -hmm. do we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you're an architect, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Regardless of gender or inclination or whatever. So I guess that's enough for the QA. For tuning in. Um, and I'd like to take a moment just to thank our corporate affiliates who are sticking with us through this very difficult time. Um, we're working with a few of them on the list, uh, Color Living. Um, uh, Color Living, we're working with Eric, we're working with Be True, um, and Steel Case to come up with more great content on the webinar platform. Um, so stay tuned uh, to our website. And on that note, the next series coming up is a series of COICs uh, where we're looking for design strategies. Uh, for resilience, greater resilience. The first one is coming up on May 14th and it's on co-living, followed by May 28th uh, and it's on co-working. Um, and then later in the year, we will have co-learning. So please stay tuned for that series. And then hopefully everyone is keeping safe. Uh, and as soon as um, things settle with the COVID-19, we will resume our voting tour programs. Um, and you can see the full list. This is the list that we had actually prepared at the beginning of the year with the uh, Museum of Art, the um, K11 Atelier, um, the Shenzhen Peking University by Renzo, and the list continues. Um, the full list is available again on the website, so please stay tuned. And, oh, this is small. Um, yes, but this is the, the, the plug. And again, Maura, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And tour and congratulations for many years of successful practice. <laughs> well, thank you for making it possible for us to do this. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank sorry. you. Ah, okay. Sorry, one one last day. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've recently revamped um, our our Facebook and our Instagram um, and also our YouTube uh, channel. So please do stay tuned for those. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, stay safe. Stay healthy. Okay. Thank you all for being here this evening. Thank and you. Thank, thank you, you, all of you who have joined the webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.